This is a podcast from The Bugle. It's been there for as long as anyone can remember. A sword stuck in a stone. Nobody knows how it got there. Presumably the stone lost a duel. Or sedimentation. I'm not a sword geographer. What people do know is that no one can get it out. Hundreds have tried, perhaps thousands, to no avail. You're just a peasant. You can't read, you can't count, you've never heard of condiments. Muscles aren't for the likes of you. They're for people with access to protein. If there's anyone who could possibly pull out that sword, it's not you, and yet something draws you to it. Not hope, not even self-esteem, but something. You grab the hilt and pull, the other villagers laugh, until it comes out. You can't believe it, you're holding the sword. You raise it aloft for all to see and a wizard appears. Does this mean I'm king, you ask? No, says the wizard, it means you're the gargle. The sonic glossy magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper for visual world. All of the news, none of the politics. This is The Gargle. I'm your host, Alice Fraser. And your guest editors for this week's edition of the magazine are Tom Neenan. Hello. Hello. And Rialina. Hello, hello. Hi. <laughs> oh, I prefer Ria's uh, greeting there. That was a lot better. What did you prefer about Ria's greeting? The energy of it. I wish I, I wish I'd gone in with that much energy. And now, now if I do it, it'll look like I'm copying her. So we'll have to just carry on. I think. I think that's. But imitation is the best form of flattery. That is true. Here we go. Imitation's the best form of flattery. <laughs> <laughs> gonna go for it. I'm gonna go. Hi. I'm so flattered. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the playground bullying that is this week's top stories, let's have a look at the front cover of the magazine. The front cover this week is King Charles posing in his new crown, as all front covers must be this week. The headlines read, Fashion fail, wearing your mum's hat. And how many scepters is too many scepters. And random trinkets you can touch to get a promotion. As well as uh, touching the orb, not just a sex move. Uh, The satirical cartoon this week is advised columnist E. Jean Carroll going shopping with a suitcase full of five million dollars, like that scene in Pretty Woman going up to a bunch of opposing lawyers and saying, a big mistake, a huge. Our top story this week is a delightful one. This is the news that jobs are safe from AI. Well, some jobs are safe from AI. It's, it's, uh, the BBC's published an article about the jobs that AI will not be able to take. Uh, Tom Neenan, I saw you beating up a robot just the other day. Can you unpack <laughs> this story for us? <laughs> you have to do it to make sure it stay upright. That's all I was doing. Um, yes, AI, the scourge of modern life. Um, there are some, but they, apparently there are some jobs, because AI can do anything now. It can do literally anything other than draw hands, um, and also many other things. So, but we're meant, to, obviously, it kept, the, the worry is all the conversations about AI are about, oh yeah, sure, now it's rubbish. Now, when you try and render anything in AI, it looks like sort of that, that odd dream that you have uh, after having about 50 whiskeys and then you go to sleep and you have this dream where like people have nine heads and are screaming at you with fire eyes. But, um, but <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all have that, that dream, right? Um, <laughs> And um, but yeah, but people say that in the future, they say it's developing so fast and it will be able to do anything. Turns out there are things AI can't do. And a lot of those things are things that require the presence of humans, um, which is a big shock. Uh, so, for instance, there's a lot of people, basically a lot of uh, cleaning and things like that. Also, doctors who uh, are there to give care, sort of, you know, make eye contact and make people who are sick feel better about themselves um, can't be done by a robot which is comforting. And of course, the biggest one, which actually isn't in the article right now, um, which is guest on the gargle. Um, (laughs) I would love to see an AI attempt to, uh, you know, come on here, sort of half, half get out three badly thought out puns and then sort of say, I've got nothing to plug. I'd love to see them do that because that's my job and they're not taking it away from me. AIs always have something to plug because they're robots. (laughs) Yes, that is true. In fact, if anything, they have a deep-seated fear of unplugging. (laughs) Oh, my God. They are going to take over in the end. Um, Am I wrong that I'm not afraid of AI? I should be, right? They're taking all of our jobs. This article really scared me because it said there are three categories of jobs that Mm. AI cannot take. The first one is creative. I'm like, okay, phew, that's us. We're fine. Yeah, yeah. Then the second one was anything that required sophisticated interpersonal relationships. And I'm like, Mm. hang on a second. That's why I do the first job. That's why I'm a comedian, <laughs> because I can't do sophisticated interpersonal relationships. And uh-huh. then the third one was those that require lots of mobility and dexterity and problem solving. And I'm like, hang on, 
That's why I stand in one place with a microphone and earn a living. <laughs> so I, I, this article has made me realize that actually I possibly am a robot. Um, <laughs> but that, and that means that if I'm a robot, it means that I am doing a creative job, which means that we can do the first one and it all falls apart. Um, I think we're all robots is what I decided last night. I maybe shouldn't have read these at three in the morning. I, I do think the takeaway from this is don't date a comedian, you know, as mm. the takeaway from all news stories are surprisingly don't date a comedian because nobody Thank will you. love you as much as 100 people will love you for an hour at a time. No one will love you forever <laughs> that much. So everyone's going to be a bit of a disappointment. And then also uh, most comedians hate themselves. And if you love them, they think you're a f-ing idiot. So... <laughs> you know, as someone who's recently entered the single market, thank you so much for that brilliant advert. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait for those DMs to just crack wide open. I love your optimism, though, saying maybe we're all robots. <laughs> I've seen the, the Matrix and they were like, what if all humans are batteries for robots? Which is <laughs> Is that even what less that was about? <laughs> I think so, right? We were batteries for robots. We weren't even like proper people. I got to watch that again. Mm. I think so. I think that's what we're doing. We're all living we're our doing? lives. We were batteries. There was yeah. some pill popping. I remember the pill popping and I mm-hmm. remember the backwards sort of yoga. There was yes. some yoga yeah, and yeah. some pill popping. And that's most of what I got from those films. Are you sure you weren't just at a music festival? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see a robot write The Matrix. Yes, a music <laughs> festival in an underground bunker. <laughs> one of the insulated categories that they suggest in this bbc article is jobs that require sophisticated interpersonal relationships as uh, ria mentioned and the, the examples that they use of sophisticated interpersonal relationships are uh, nurses business consultants and investigative journalism uh and i think i feel like that is true for everyone except investigative journalists i think every movie i've ever seen about an investigative journalist they've got a divorce mm. somewhere in their past and you know they're sleeping on <laughs> half a mattress and <laughs> drinking cold coffee with their own cigarette stubs in them. So I, I feel like yeah. oh, I dated that. You are so right as well. <laughs> that, that is so true. And they're completely incapable of sophisticated interpersonal relationships because they've always oh, got to get the story. Yeah, the story yeah, yeah. comes first. Protect your sources. Get the story. <laughs> And then there's just a bit where you have a montage of knocking on people's doors, right? That's the you've got that's the main bit is the montage, the knocking, the do you know this man kind of stuff. I feel like a robot could do that pretty easily. Well, I sort of feel like it's very telling about today's society that people are afraid of robots taking our jobs. I think a few, uh, 50 years ago in a sort of a, a sci-fi tech utopian dream, people thought mm. robots would take our jobs and that would mean we'd have heaps of leisure time and uh, ability to you know enjoy our families and pursue so the true. arts and so on and so forth and wallow in a sort of a blissful uh, futurism. But now I think everyone is so stressed out that the prospect of robots uh, taking their jobs just means you're mm-hmm. going to have to do a, shit, a shitter job for less money. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I, I can think of a number of people who work in Amazon warehouses who are probably like, take my job, please take my job. So I agree <laughs> with you on that one. But I do think there is an irony to us sort of going, ooh, I've got the latest dishwasher or my washing machine can play Beethoven. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, so we're happy in some circumstances. And then in others, we're, we're absolutely petrified. But it's yeah. been happening for years. I mean, ever since they invented, like, the loom. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn loom. Machines have been taking our jobs and yet we've managed to we've managed to evolve beyond it. So I'm yeah. confident that I'm confident there's there's a place for us. I, I think we've evolved beyond the need for actual tasks to keep us busy. Uh mm-hmm. it, in insofar as like it seems like no matter how much labor we save with mechanization or artificial intelligence or computers, we still manage to be even busier and more stressed out. Uh to the point where we'll just be desperately trying to keep up with our quota of watching TikTok videos that we don't like uh, <laughs> in order to get our next promotion. Uh, yeah. th- this article suggests we seek roles in dynamic shifting environments that include unpredictable tasks as a good way to stave off job loss to AI. So, you know, fingers crossed for that dystopian future. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like we're all going to live in the Big Brother house. I don't know if that's yeah. <laughs> a, better, a better life. Can anyone really be said to live in the Big Brother? House? <laughs> <laughs> exist, exist. I am. Um, I had a very early experience of losing a job to a robot because I was cast as um, Johnny Five in Short Circuit, and then they um, they realised that there's a robot that could do that a lot better, and so I, I was sacked. <laughs> Brutal. I'm so sorry because you would have been great at that. I loved that thank movie, you. but I didn't realise. Yeah, I'm going to watch it again you, with new eyes. 
I feel like the only strategy here is to take back ground from robots. So I, for one, am planning to strap some baseball bats to my arms and go in robot wars, start beating up those tiny <laughs> little toys. Yeah, yes. I can take that. Yes. Take that oh little my. tinker toy. <laughs> the Fraser Tron. I would watch that. Can you do I it in kick like the shit out of an aggressive toaster? Yes. <laughs> Make it Those happen. smart toasters have got a real lip on them. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be wearing roller skates. I don't. I don't trust. I don't trust roller skates. Everything's gone downhill since the wheel. Hello. <laughs> oh. High five. High five. High five. Boom. <laughs> Very nice. Boom. Here's your ad section in which I read a series of ads for things that don't exist. Unless you send an email in to hellobuglers at thebuglepodcast.com. That's an email address and you can send in your ad and then it will come onto this show and I'll write an ad about it and then I'll put it here and people will know that it's real because I'll say it in a slightly more serious voice. <laughs> Let's face it, everyone wants tentacles, but have you ever really aspired to be an octopus? Of course not. Round, stupid idiots, octopuses can't even decide on how to plural themselves. Octopodes? Octopi? Why can't they be more streamlined? Now they can. With squid. Longer, thinner, less confusingly multiple. Now they can. Squids. Squids, the greyhound of octopuses. (laughs) You're an infinite being of pure thought, but have you ever wanted to be more itchy? If you've ever dreamed of being finite, of constantly dwindling in your potential, of growing fingernails, then you need matter. Exist in space and time with matter. Brought to you by Matter Matters, the biggest bang this side of the quantum singularity. He was a hotshot corporate lawyer with an eye for the kill. She was a non-sentient AI that made his job obsolete. Now he's having to retrain in IT. Will they fall in love? He can't and she's not. No matter how much he hits on her, she'll never feel a thing. Or will she? Can one man without a heart learn to teach a robot to love? The AI who loved me, straight to streaming this summer. (laughs) You're a very attractive, important person and you deserve to celebrate special occasions in style. Now you can celebrate opposite day in style with half a water of glass. Half a water of glass. Drinking it may cause gastric discomfort, mouth shards or death. Art news now and... uh, Kids, unfortunately, mm. are not trustworthy. Ria, you've got some children of, of your own. Can you unpack this children news now? Yes. So uh, there was a museum. Are we allowed to name things? Yes. <laughs> There's a memorial to landscape architect Capability Brown, which can I just say the name, the name mm. alone, the name alone, right? Capability Brown. What a great name. <laughs> anyway, so they decided to give out activity packs at this at, at this museum uh, for the kids to keep them engaged. And in the activity pack, they gave them crayons uh, because they're quiet. Parents like crayons because they're quiet. Uh, and I guess they forgot to give them paper. So the kids are like, what should I do with these crayons? So as they walked around the memorial, they just drew on the statues instead and the, and the memorials and things like that. So, yes, there's some... Beautiful crayon. Now they did. They were they were quick to stress that most visitors, most visitors are fine. It was just a couple of stray kids that went. Well, it's a white statue and it's a crayon. What do you expect me to do with this crayon? And um, I think the real question is, did it add or detract from the art? And that is that's the perpetual question of art, isn't it? Good question. Hmm. All art is in reaction to previous art. All art uh, draws on the uh, art of the past in in a very um, metaphorical and real way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is a wonderful thing. I think this is a tribute to the fact that uh, marble statues in the olden days would have been very colourfully painted and the fact that the paint chipped Mm -hmm. off and made us think monochrome was classy is probably Mm -hmm. one of the worst things that's happened to art in the last couple of thousand years. So I I bring back the colour to um, all of the statues. I agree. They brought blue to Capability Brown. I mean, to me, there's meaning. There's meaning in that. (laughs) Look at a color wheel and tell me that doesn't mean something. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, do people know what birds do to statues? Because (laughs) compared to that, this is is perfectly (laughs) polite. Also, sorry, do people give children crayons and expect them to sort of, the children to go, well, I better... I better be responsible with these. I better make sure that this only goes on surfaces that are absolutely uh, appropriate because have those people ever met children? Do they understand the concept of children? Or the concept of crayons. If exactly. It come off on, <laughs> if it comes off on a surface, it was meant to be. Exactly. Have you ever tried to crayon a window? 
No. I'm currently in the midst of training my one and a half year old uh, to draw on herself. Um, which people think is a kind of an irresponsible and messy parenting thing uh, mm. of me to do. But she loves drawing on herself and it means that she is not, anytime she's drawing on herself, she's not actively drawing on a thousand-year-old statue. <laughs> and don't all women literally draw on themselves every morning when they wake up? I'm not, mm-hmm. like, not when they wake up. They have a cup of tea and a coffee or whatever. But mm-hmm. Yeah, Laser Fraser painting. is a makeup influencer drawing <laughs> brown stripes <laughs> on her own feet. <laughs> it's a TikTok. Good point. As long as she's talking about something at the same time, though. You can't just draw on your feet. You have to also inform or educate. Also, don't you have to split half the screen and half of it to uh, some DIY of someone, like, fixing a leaky pipe or something? Isn't yeah, that what TikTok in, in is? Yeah, in reaction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't downloaded TikTok. I don't know what it is. Your it's kid's exactly a genius that. is what we're saying. Your kid, your kid <laughs> is, is got huge potential. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to argue, but don't make me tell you adorable stories about her because it'll it'll last the whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Once she was at a, a museum in uh, in Croom and uh, crazy stuff happened. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one story, but only because it's relevant. When we okay. were in uh, Melbourne, at the we went to the National uh, Art Gallery and the NGA National National Gallery, and uh, she because I was I was sort of trying to get her enthused about the process of seeing art. I would I pointed as we came in. I said, "Look, art." And then for the rest of the hour that we were going around the gallery, she would stampede extremely quickly into every next room and go, art! And then everyone, <laughs> in, the quiet, everyone in the quiet, you know, museum mode would look over their shoulders disapprovingly at this child reveling in art. I Where's the lie, though? Good. Where's the lie? Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Um, AI can't take that job. Yeah. No. Of <laughs> shouting art. Tiny art curator. Yeah. Joy, joy though. Yes. I think I think it's the run up as well. It's the d- oh d- yeah d- 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 <laughs> art. That's <laughs> love it. Now it's time for your reviews. As you know, each week we ask our guest editors to bring in something to review out of five stars. Uh, Ria, what have you brought in for us this week? I would like to review sending your kids away on camping trips with school. Um, <laughs> Uh, essentially do you do you have a kid at home a lot of the time with you if not all of the time with you do you need a yes. break yes <laughs> well can i highly recommend s- sending them off on that end of primary school trip to the to the to the woods um it's it's low cost it's low maintenance you get five days where you don't have to do the school run but you also don't have to get up and put the telly on for the cartoons or make a breakfast i i just i I can't i have to say six out of five stars for this six out of five stars in fact if anything they should do it more often (laughs) i mean every time there's a teacher strike send them camping do you know you know why am i having them at home send them off camping all right Give them the outdoors. They get to run around. They get to breathe, um, what's it called? Oxygen. <laughs> you know. And all you have to do is a couple loads of laundry at the end of it. Genius. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> That's pretty great. Uh, Tom Neenan, have you brought anything in to review? And how many stars is it? Uh, yes, I have. But in a in a because we're talking about AI, I have not written these reviews. These are reviews that I have found because I recently Ooh. took a trip to uh, Sirencester. So I like to do uh, read reviews of places where I go. And this was so this was first of all one star review from a pub nearby, which I won't name. Um, what can I say? Okay, but pub going well. However, I went into the men's toilets to find a woman uh, bent over the toilet with a man behind her, and she had her pint in the toilet. Charming, one star. So that <laughs> I didn't go there, but Ew. I mean that's a bit that's a bit coarse. But this one I love because this one sounds like a Wilfred Owen poem, and this is a review. Um, it's not from Siren Sessor. This is a review from my lo- uh, local um, subway. And if you read it out, it sounds like some some harrowing World War One poetry. It's a one star review of the uh, the subway near my house. Dead flies on the chopping board where the bread was put. Dead flies on the display case. Put salami in my subway, which I didn't order. One star. <laughs> it's moving. I, I thought that was so harrowing. Haunting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's 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 horrific to put <laughs> salami. In a sausage, in a sandwich that you didn't order. Yep. That's a Awful. huge oversight. <laughs> it really is. And this person has turned it into, yeah, into some traumatic poetry. So that's two one stars. <laughs> <How many? laughs> 
which I guess is, I guess he averages out to one star, right, for uh, amenities in England. <laughs> That's my reviews. I just asked ChatGPT to review the Gargle podcast. Oh. Um, well, actually, I've, I've asked Agent GPT, which then decides itself how to um, prompt itself. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, it's thinking... Because it has to go, but this is what it's done. It's come up with a task list of how it's going to do this. To perform uh, the review, it's going to, one, access the Gargle podcast platform or hosting website. Two, navigate to the episode list or archive section. Three, select an episode and click play. Four, listen to the episode in its entirety, taking notes or highlighting key points as necessary. Five, repeat steps three to four for all episodes of the Gargle podcast, ensuring that each episode is given equal attention and consideration. So just want you to know that that's how ChatGPT would review wow this podcast yes but then i wow. think it's actually gone away to do that so we won't be here <laughs> for a while. oh my god we have so many hours of content <laughs> can i recommend nobody listen back carefully to all of our episodes taking notes <gasps> what's happened Oh, no, it set itself another subtask. All right. Um, subtask. Oh, no. <laughs> Write a comprehensive review of the podcast, including its strengths, weaknesses, and recommendations for improvement. I don't know no, if you want to hear no, that. No, no, no I don't. I didn't think so <laughs> no, you don't understand how reviews work in the modern world. No. Okay, it's either one star, I had a horrible time, mm -hmm. uh, or five stars, I want this person to keep their job. Those are the only <laughs> options. <laughs> Backpack news now, and this is the news uh, that backpacks are being banned uh, in a Michigan school district. Concerns over the use of backpacks to conceal guns <laughs> have been used to leverage uh, a ban of backpacks. So if you want to uh, bring your gun, you're going to have to find a better way to sneak it in. <laughs> Ria, you've mm -hmm. been to America. <laughs> can you unpack this story for us? No, I can't because I'm not allowed a backpack. Um, at best, I can... <laughs> lay out three small items from my small personal purse and that's it but yes michigan has decided to ban backpacks entirely because some districts had adopted a clear backpack they said okay if your backpack is completely clear which i'm guessing is like a swim bag you know you can get those clear swim bags then then you can bring your stuff in and now they've decided no no you can still hide uh a weapon in a clear backpack if you like wrap it in your sweatshirt or something so now they've said all you can have is this tiny small personal purse and i don't know what they're this so now kids are gonna i mean it brings new meaning to he carried my books to school for me <laughs> i mean in in that regard i think we're gonna see romances blossoming all over the place but i don't i don't know Really, where is the learning happening? I've lost sight of the learning. I think we've all lost sight of the learning in school. School is now no longer a place to go and learn. It's a place to go and be scared. It's a place to, to build your biceps as you carry everything individually. It, you know, it's like going through airport security. I I don't... Is there any... Would you send your kids to school anymore if... if well, first of all, the clear backpack, I mean, that's bad enough because those that's not a good look. But now, no. you're, you're, you know, you're sending everyone with a little personal purse. And I'm all for expression. Like, I kind of like the idea that to say to my sons, I'm sorry, you can't use a backpack. You have to have a small personal purse <laughs> for your items. I think it's character building mm. at minimum. But they also, what they, I mean, they haven't thought this through. You know those really baggy trousers that, that skaters used to wear? You can hide an entire shotgun down one leg. Like, they, I mean... This is just going to bring back, if they really take this to its ad absurdum, we're going to have girls in the skimpiest miniskirts ever just so that they can't secrete anything on their person. I feel like this is an arms race, either for teeny tiny guns or <laughs> no clothes at school, which oh boy, <laughs> is problematic among teenagers, yeah. to say the I mean, least. I mean, I, 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 know it's, I know we're supposed to try and be funny here, but I do think it's just, it's, it's scary. It's really, really scary how they keep skirting around pardon the pun, the issue, which isn't how do we stop them taking guns to school? Um, oh, no. How do we stop them being capable of taking guns to school? It's stop the guns. Mm. I don't understand why we can't. It's stop the guns. And then we see here in the UK, we don't have this problem because we don't have guns. So kids <laughs> can use backpacks and, you know, they 
and not well they're still not allowed to wear mini skirts because we're uptight and we're british but in fact yeah. in all australian schools it's compulsory to bring a gun-shaped bag to school <laughs> because there's no guns here and so uh, we just show off the fact that we're allowed to to carry our fake gun bags around i think that's and they're just full I- of skittles Mm. Skittles? And then if we're really angry, we aim them at someone and go, taste the rainbow, and the Skittles sort of fall out the front. That's beautiful. Like a mm. like a modern remake of Bugsy Malone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because this is, um, uh, it is uh, really troubling. And usually when you read like a, a story this, this sort of troubling or this sort of, you know, idiotic, you ask, God, what are they putting in the water over there? Um, but this is a story from Flint, Guns. Michigan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This is from Flint, Michigan, where we do know that they are putting awful stuff in the water there. So it is a <laughs> um, a real problem. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, this is why they're banning books, right? Because we're better to hide it. I tell you what, okay, I'm gonna. This is the thing. The most dangerous weapon that you can have in a school is information. <laughs> Would be true if people weren't bringing guns into school. That is the problem. Um, they're also, banning both, though, aren't they? They're ban- both well, are banned. Yeah, you can't take books and you can't take backpacks um, into yeah. school. Um, so, yeah, I think basically you bring your apple for the teacher, you put that on the desk, and they say, get things out, you can't you can't take anything out. And so everyone just sits there uh, and then, I'm guessing, just waits uh, for another active shooter drill to happen to sort of break up the tedium. America's fun, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, in America, I feel like the apple on the teacher's desk is just something to aim at. Uh... <laughs> William Tell style. When I was little and we lived in America briefly, uh, when we went trick-or-treating, we weren't allowed to eat the apples because they're like, there's razors in the apples. So we weren't allowed to eat the apples. Wow. Because somebody once put a razor in an apple. Yeah, I think that time, the number of times that has happened is one time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. One time and now nobody eats the apples. Also, who needs to tell the trick-or-treat children not to eat the apple? Come yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, following that logic of that story, which we've all heard, right, the raises in the apples, is so mad because here's the thing. You you um, you trick-or-treat around your neighbourhood, right? That's the whole point. You don't, like, travel out of town to trick-or-treat. So you go to someone's house, they give you something, and then I'm assuming if that thing then harms your child you know where that person lives and you know what they did. So they're basically going, oh, I want to be criminally, held criminally responsible for uh, injuring a child and everyone knows where I live. Why would you do that? Injuring my entire neighbourhood. Yes. Why? Who would, who, what psychopath would make that decision? My mother used to, but still the safety was, safety is, you know, don't eat anything that hasn't, that's been unwrapped or is tampered with or anything like that. My mother, because she was a health freak, was like, I'm not giving out candy. That's not good for you. So she would pop popcorn and then wrap a bunch of popcorn in a sandwich bag and hand those out. And I'm like, no one's eating those. No one's going to eat the the, the clearly home popped popcorn in a sandwich bag. (laughs) Broke my heart, really. Oh, that's Halloween. That's why Halloween's the scariest night of the year. It only cost her $3, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair enough. But the arsenic that we sprinkled on it, that was more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Transfer News now, and this is our last story uh, of the podcast. This is the news that Saudi universities are getting into a real kind of throwdown about prestige, trying to entice top professors to switch schools, sometimes with things like cash money, uh, which professors aren't used to having. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you mm. like kicking a ball. Can you unpack this story? <laughs> for us? I went into this with scepticism, I have to be honest. Sorry, Saudi Arabia bribing people to make themselves look better. Does that sound like the Saudi Arabia that you know and love? I think not. Um, yeah, something something's happening here where um, the people who do that thing have done that thing again. And they are trying to um, persuade uh, persuade uh, lecturers uh, to sort of... Now, I, I didn't... I, I, I must admit, I didn't quite get all the stuff about the various standings because I don't understand academia and I got out of it as soon as I possibly could. But I'm guessing the idea is that they are trying to sort of boost and, and, and artificially inflate their standing, their ac- like academic standing of certain universities by luring uh, university professors over with uh, cash incentives. Um which also, I mean, to be their fair, it sounds like saying, hey, you're good at your job. Would you like to be paid better for it? Which isn't the worst way of going about your business, but maybe is slightly underhanded in this sense. 
Well, the, I feel like the problem here is uh, that the, a, any metric can mm. is immediately gamed. So any metric you can measure will immediately be gamed. And this mm-hmm. is what has happened to the university over the last 25 years is mm. that you've gone from general vibe of good universityness <laughs> to trying to measure how you make a good university, which has got to do with these like elaborate ranking systems about how many p- times you're published and how many times you're cited and what level mm. of journal and then the journals sort of try to amp themselves up so that then they can get more prestige and then the universities try to get themselves more prestige and they try to quantify prestige and then of course uh, uh, what you end up is is these universities competing for international students who pay the highest fees yes and um, that's what they're all in the game for and the uh, the whole learning for the sake of learning can go f- itself mm-hmm. um so it's a, it's a super weird system, and uh, Saudi Arabia, as with all super weird systems, mm. Saudi Arabia is doubling down on gaming the gaming. I mean, I'm just happy that you know that finally someone's gone. What's the one thing that no one wants to do at university, and that is drink alcohol. So finally, there is a place where you can be safe and you can actually do your studying rather than getting up to drinking alcohol, <laughs> which no one wants you to do at university anyway. Well, actually, I'm going to interject there because one of the problems with this gaming of the of the system is the fact that they're paying these top researchers to say that they're affiliated with Saudi Arabian universities, but mm. actually they don't have to do any work or any teaching or anything. So what they're doing is they're throwing the, their universities up the rankings. Mm. Then people are going and arriving to find that there are actually no teachers. There's no oh, teachers. Wow. They all live in other cities because <laughs> they just say, oh, I'm affiliated. Oh, no, I don't. I don't go there. I've never been there. I've never yeah. even talked to them. I have... I, it's a self-declaration on one website where you can go, I am first affiliated with, and you can get paid 70 grand or whatever to say, oh, I'm affiliated with the Saudi uni. But actually, wow. you live in Spain or you live in South America or you live in the States and they just give but you money. And you might do it for classroom, a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the classroom is full of prestige, which is what they came for <laughs> in the first place. Mm, delicious prestige. True. Drink it in. <laughs> Tastes good, especially in the sun. sun. I don't know what it is, but vitamin C, vitamin D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes so well. But then isn't, I mean, isn't this sort of what happened at the start of sort of the, the Oxbridge thing, which is not, that it's sort of different in the sense that all they had was they were the only places to study. And so the prestige came from the fact that there was just an absence of anywhere else to go and study. Yes, well, I, th- I think what, what we need to do is uh, start it all from scratch. Start yes. it all from, from the beginning, fire all of the professors and, and institute primary school uh, level children yeah. uh, safe. <laughs> Safe, backpack-free children, yes. uh, and they can start. They can start learning from the beginning. We'll just wipe out all human knowledge and begin again, and see what happens and how long <laughs> it takes for us to f- it up. Yeah, but careful because they'll reinvent the wheel. Alice, <laughs> and the next thing you know, it all goes downhill, downhill again. again. <laughs> you know when people say, "Forget everything you know about something." That is, we have to actually have that. Everyone has to completely uh, sort of clear their minds, and we start academia from scratch again. Yeah, but do you know what? As hard as I try, every time I get on a bike, I still know how to ride it. Oh, damn it. Do you know it. what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's harder to get on a bike and <laughs> consciously make yourself fall. Yeah, you'll just walk into a, you'll walk into a classroom with a pr- completely blank mind and think, mm. mm, Derrida would have had something to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us to the end of today's show. I'm flipping through the ads at the back. Ria, have you got anything to plug? Yes, I'd love to plug my tour. Thank you. I'm going on tour. If you're in the UK, uh, I will be traveling around in the autumn. So please go to Rialina.com for tickets. I think some have sold out, but there's still tickets in other places. So come see me. Come see Rialina. Tom, have you got anything to plug? Do I? Do I ever? Uh, I am at T Nina on Twitter. I believe that the um, uh, the the Sky Short that we made is being released on the 24th of May, 24th of this Ooh. month, which is exciting. So uh, nice. I think I can say that. If not. <laughs> what are they going to do we've made it now um, and so yeah I think that's that's coming out then so check out that I think on YouTube as well as it's being released on Sky as well I'd like to say a big thank you uh, to our roving reporters Sam Rugg James VT who sent in the crayons Abdo Waba who sent in the backpack story and uh, if you would like to be a roving reporter tweet us at Hello Garglas on Twitter and tell us the story that you think we should do on this podcast We are doing a live gargle in Edinburgh this year on the 15th and the 22nd of August. You can go and find that on thebuglepodcast.com. Go buy tickets and come and see it because if if you don't come, it'll just be like this. (laughs) (laughs) Just a normal recording of a normal podcast. Nobody (laughs) wants that. (laughs) 
This is an Alice Fraser and Bugle podcast production. I'm Alice Fraser. Find me online at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser, where I have my weekly salons, my weekly writer's workshops, if you'd like to write with me. And we're about to launch a book club, which will not do the thing that I hate about book clubs, which is to say, make you read a book. Uh, You just show up and then we read or look at something together and then we talk about it there. So patreon.com slash Alice Fraser. I'm also in Edinburgh. I'm also in Tokyo. I'm also in London. I'm all over the place. Uh, Look behind you. I'm right there. Your editor is Ped Hunter. Your executive producer is Chris Skinner. I'll talk to you again next week. You can listen to other programs from The Bugle, including The Bugle, Catharsis, Tiny Revolutions, Top Stories and The Gargle, wherever you find your podcasts. 